you're hanging out in the House of Sunny podcast, where it's always sunny, mostly because of your host, comedian and YouTuber, Sunny Loman. Want to know what Sunny and her friends are thinking about this week? Well, here she is, Sunny Loman. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the House of Sunny podcast. This is our last cast for about a month, I think. So we're going to make it a good one. Right, Doug? We'll try. Do our best. This will probably be our worst one. <laughs> It'll probably be the best. This will be the best podcast we've ever done. Best podcast ever. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to talk about the the totally gay, you can't say gay bill that's coming out of Florida. Actually, I think it's not a bill anymore. I think it's been passed. Um, Just a bill. <laughs> I don't know how that works. I need to go watch Capitol that. Hill. Remember I need that? to go rewatch that cartoon. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to talk about discrimination against Russians and the, whatever we have to say about the Ukrainian war and stuff like that. So let's get into it. Um, let's talk about Russia first, because. OK, so what we're seeing is, first of all, I heard that Dostoevsky was banned by an Italian university. The, yeah. And. I'm going to bring up the link for this. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, <laughs> I mean, talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? Is this really what we've come to? We're going to ban great art from a long, long time ago because Putin. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, okay. you can't even write that. You can't even write this stuff. Now, thankfully, they backtracked. But the fact that educators, a university even considered this. Yeah, exactly. And then you think that's just an anomaly. But here's something else. I wonder if I have to tell me if you see that. They're all about the symbols. Um, do you see this? Yeah, I see the, the Newsweek article. Okay, now I have to stop sharing and then reshare this other. Apparently, I have can't just share my entire screen. I have to do it piecemeal here. Are we going to ban Tchaikovsky and like the, you know, that's what I'm the 1812 Tolstoy. Uh, you think, are you, you think you're joking? Rachmaninoff. Look at this. Cardiff oh, no. Philharmonic replaces the program of its upcoming all Tchaikovsky concert, citing it as an inappropriate time. I was kidding. Yeah, I know you were <laughs> except. Wow. <laughs> Not except there's no such thing as parody today because it's all a freaking clown show. So Tchaikovsky and Dostoevsky are canceled because Russia invades Ukraine. Wow. Which, by the way, you know, it's just a, once again, it's not like it's cut and dry. There's a lot of stuff out there about how NATO has been poking Putin and they're encouraging Ukraine to do this. And it's really kind of gross. Yes. So should can we ban German philosophy because of the Nazis? Can we? I mean, that actually be good, right? That would actually be all right. Can we do that? I guess let's, so. Let's like, start a campaign. They haven't, they haven't gotten around to that yet. Let's start a campaign. I mean, My God. since apparently, you know, I'm Hitler was bad, okay, but in that realm, in in like the history of the world, there but were Napoleon. many. There were many people like him. So I so mean. Well, let's ban French writers like Hugo and stuff because yeah, because Napoleon. Napoleon. Well, how right. about the United States? We invaded Iraq and Afghanistan. Should we just ban America? Yeah. Where do you stop with this? It's uh, it's insanity. Um, I guess they are I, banning America. It it's, and then uh, Russians are being um, well, they're being harassed. And I talked to some Russian friends of mine today who live here in California, and they said they haven't experienced anything, but they're hearing of people they know as they're traveling. Um, uh, and then they're reading stories. A couple of Russian guys got beat up in Egypt by a Ukrainian group of guys. So there's, you know, but that's to be a, if two countries are at war, I would expect yeah. groups of guys in various nations to. Of course duke it out a little bit we fight over um, soccer and football i mean right <laughs> but the whole we're banning art and then um there's just a lot of chatter about deplatforming russians within this country russian people just people who live in america 
And then uh, another story that I read here, I'm going to share it with you. Doug, you're, you'll be able to talk about this. Uh, where the heck is, sorry. Okay. Um, there's this whole story. Coinbase says it's blocked 25,000 Russian accounts as the crypto exchange steps up its efforts to stamp out illicit activity. Right. Um, and But what they consider illicit activity is probably just, I, I don't really know because we're just anti-Russia now. So if you're connected at all to. What's illicit activity? How do they know? Like, are they going to stamp out illicit activity across the United, across the world and the globe? So they're monitoring wallets for so-called illicit activity. Since when do they do that? Yeah. It's and, just absolute you know, bullshit. For those of us who, who look at what happened on January 6th and see the insane overreaction and the imprisonment of innocent Americans or Americans who maybe did misdemeanor trespassing and they've been in prison now for a year. Um, uh, you know, you just, when you hear authorities go illicit activity, like it's all misinformation. That's the same kind of thing. It's all potentially BS in the sense that what they consider a crime is not a crime, not necessarily a crime. I mean, I would normally be against Russian gangsters, um, you know, being able to operate in the open with our, with our, systems, but actually I'm not against that unless they are convicted. You know, it's like, right. you can't just do this to people. But wasn't people that the whole promise a trial. of trial? Wasn't that the whole promise of crypto was that you couldn't have some arbitrary central authority shut you down and shut down your ability to transact because some bureaucrats somewhere decided that what you're doing is wrong. I mean, the whole point and the whole sales pitch of these cryptocurrencies was there's no authority. There's no centralized authority. No one can control it. Um, and so like a government like China or the United States or something like that can't shut you down. And here, that's exactly what they're doing. So like, what what's the case for crypto again? I mean, what we're seeing here is the world, th- this is like a modern reaction that we're witnessing where, you know, the digital, you know, it, this whole idea of social credit scoring, where a, an authority some central authority can dictate morality and then police people through digital finance, banking, um, now cryptocurrencies, uh, sanctions, imports. Yeah. It's like deplatforming people, whatever. Yeah. Everyone's hooked into this big network and now they realize they have a lot of power. It's It's absolutely terrifying. This idea that basically they could cut you off from working anywhere in the world. Because they're all colluding. So if you have like a particular skill and you've developed it over time, let's say you're a doctor, but you're going to be deplatformed and canceled. You're going to have your license revoked because you're spreading misinformation. Um, you know, and and yes, that was the whole reason to buy crypto to avoid this ki- kind of encroaching totalitarianism. The blockchain, it's supposed to, uh, you know, keep us all anonymous or something so that we can't be targeted, but apparently we can be. So. And look at what Trudeau did in Canada. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, like freezing people's crypto accounts. They were able to get at those. They were able to freeze people's bank accounts, prevent people from working. I mean, they were this is like the I don't know. There's this part of the Great Reset, the Great Reset from Klaus Schwab, where you know, like they can now control everybody's behavior through these uh, digital platforms. Well, and, and did you see? T- did you see today that Biden announced that the U.S. government is now going to look into a digital dollar? Yeah, they've been studying that a lot. Um, so, you know, they're making it official. This is where we're headed, and I, I mean. That's no, absolutely no. So I, I feel like, gosh, they are just increasing. It, it's so scary right now. We're so obviously headed into a recession, maybe a major depression. Prices are through the roof. Oil's through the roof. They're going to go higher as oil goes up. And then there's, there's a lag time, right? Oil's going up. So now everything you buy that gets shipped to you, which is everything, is going to go up by the same percentage, at least. And 
manufacturing is going to go up. Like this is going to be really, really hard. We're going to go through a hard time. There's no getting out of this at this point. There's nothing we can do to stop a few bad years, at least, even if we had a really good president right now, um, there would be a lag to any benefit that would come of somebody doing the right thing. And did you hear that they just introduced another trillion dollar bill last night? Congress? No, no, I didn't. So they're continuing to just, yes. And and somebody said, this was an interesting part of that story. They dropped a new omnibus bill last night for a trillion dollar spending bill. And in that is another hundred billion increase to the uh, HHS. Is that what it is? Health and Human Services, which has been the disaster agency that basically caused COVID. So we're going to give them another hundred billion dollars. I mean, not only are we not holding these agencies accountable, we're increasing their budget and we're doing it through inflation, just printing money. Well, you know, the die has been cast for years. Ever since the advent of COVID, I think the central bank has increased its balance sheet by $8 trillion. Yeah. That's how much has been created. Today, they officially stopped quantitative easing, which will probably start in another two months. But they've been literally printing money every month to the tune of tens, hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, for the last, since the financial crisis in 2008, but certainly since COVID when they went crazy with it. And, you know, so this trajectory... We, we were on this trajectory of higher and higher prices well before this Russia-Ukraine business. And now it's going to get worse. And now they're banning, you know, Russian oil <laughs> imports. Um, Europe is already um, denuclearified, if that's a word. They, they went away from nuclear. They tried to go towards renewables. And now they're, I mean, they're screwed. I don't know what they're They've already do. been dealing with a really tough energy short, you know, energy price shortage. People have already been dealing with that in the UK anyway. I've, I heard stories just oh, a couple absolutely. years ago about how they were really struggling there with energy and energy prices. Poor people were having a hard time affording heat. This is in England, you know, this isn't like, we're not and talking about Somalia. This is, and these are like, um, this is the classic leftist psychology of if you just wish for it, it'll appear. Yeah. You know, we want, we would really like to have energy, an energy source that's really cheap, and abundant and causes no effect whatsoever. Yeah. We just want that. And so let's just ban everything that we don't like and somehow the stuff will appear. And there's and then Biden bans Russian imports to the United States. They've done everything in their power to increase the price of crude oil, including well, shutting down pipelines. And now he's, he's threatening uh, oil companies or gas companies uh, for price gouging their customers. <laughs> So we'll do everything to decrease the supply. Then when prices increase, they say we're going to punish the businessmen who increase their prices. I mean, I almost feel crazy. like the war, this whole Russia thing is to cover the tracks of how bad their policies are causing inflation. Joe Biden was asked today or yesterday, what is he going to do about gas prices? And he basically said nothing. It's Putin's fault. Right. Right. We're seeing that. And it's like, wait a minute, this was going up way before it's, it's again, it's like that example that we talked about a couple of weeks ago where, uh, you were noticing supply shortages for a year and then the trucker convoy in Canada started and they are like, well, the truckers are causing the supply shortages. It's like, (laughs) it's only been happening for a week. So that's not possible. But I think they get away with it to some extent. I know that, you know, there's a certain segment of people who just repeat that. They just yeah. take it in and they that's the answer. And I don't know if they're not paying attention, if they're needing to rationalize, you know, they're just taking the talking point and not thinking it through in the in the way that do you remember in Atlas Shrugged how um James Taggart would be like about to think about something and he would just swerve his attention. And Ayn Rand would sort of write this thing where, uh, oh, and you know, boom. And he's like, not going to think about that. Not going to go there. Not yeah. going to think about it. Not going to let my mind think about it. Distraction. Go here, go here, go here. Mm-hmm. Don't think about it. Knowing though, deep down that it was all a lie and it was all a contradiction. Well, and and I mean, think of the stuff. I mean, we've, we've gone over this before, but 
you know, th this might be part of the plan, which is to inundate people with crises. And when you inundate people with crises and you're just lurching from one crisis to the next, you never have time to come up for air and really think about what's happening to you. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, they're passing more and they're doing more and they're, they're, that's, they're printing that's... money, passing regulations and doing it. And all this stuff is all of a sudden it's been implemented and you're like, yeah, God, what's the next crisis here? And, and you know, the biggest problem we have is we just don't have strong opposition. When you have, you know, the Republicans just eager for war in Ukraine, eager for spending another trillion dollars. Oh, they love you it. You know, there are they're really this. It's a uniparty system that we're living under, and that's why it's just this avalanche. And as a Californian who you were just talking about this liberal wish list, where you know it doesn't matter that none of it can actually happen <laughs> at the same time. This morning I was um, just on Twitter and Gavin Newsom did a perfect example of that. I'm going to share that, see if I can find it really quick. Um, okay. California, here's his tweets. <laughs> California raised the minimum wage. We increased paid sick leave, provided more paid family leave, expanded child care. And this year we'll be the first state to provide health for all, regardless of immigration status. Wow. And then later he was like uh, something about it's all free. We lead on climate policy, you know, um, but he said something else that was a just complete contradiction of that. Let's scroll down. You, know, you know, this is the liberal mind is I don't like gun violence. I don't like the fact that people get shot, ban guns. Yeah. You know, I don't like the fact that people don't have transportation. Well, just have public transportation. Well, people don't have houses, public housing. I mean, it's always this like one step, like childlike uh, knee jerk reaction to uh, any problem in, in the world that they think they can control. And I think that's the essence of the liberal mindset is I can control reality. I can control everything around me. And instead of being comfortable with risk and freedom and um, the, the ups and downs of life, whatever things happen, bad things happen. People have to help each other, whatever they want to control everything they want. And they, they literally think that this is that simple. I don't like guns. I don't like people getting shot. Well, just ban guns. And that's all we have to really do. think that I, I always, I, I go back and forth between they do. They're kind of insane and they're, I don't want to say stupid, but they live with these contradictions and they believe it. They believe their own BS or they're, they're really gross psychopath control freaks. You know, I, I think they're gross psychopathic control freaks. And then that creates the need mm. for these, like on an ad hoc basis for these really simplistic, stupid uh, solutions where they don't consider unintended consequences, like minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Hey, people, you know, it'd be sunny. It would be nice if everyone made a lot of money. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, increase the wage, force yeah. everyone to pay higher wages. Right. I mean, that's like the poster child of stupidity, right. like where you're trying to reverse engineer reality. A lot of these Democrats who've come over to the right, who I admire and I appreciate for being free speech absolutists. I mean, they really do care about people's liberty. I mean, they're, I, I hear them talk now, like people like um, uh, Russell Brandt and um, who's that other Jim, Jimmy Dorsey is mm -hmm. that his name? Who has that show? Um, you know, they're great. They're really great. And, and then they'll say something like, um, you know, pay off student loans and universal basic income. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, you know, it's it's the whole uh, Trotsky dilemma. Like he's supposedly an idealist. <laughs> you overthrow a government and you end up with Stalin. I didn't mean to do that. You know, yeah. like uh, I, I'm for people's freedom. I'm for I'm for people doing better, not worse. I'm not for killing. I'm not for you know all of these. Yeah, I'm not we for didn't putting mean for this to happen. Right. But what they fail to get is that literally that system of stealing from one people and redistributing to others will create a system where the best thieves 
and killers rise to the top because that's who's good at that. The people who are good at that system of redistribution, stealing, which is what that is, uh, they're going to be the most ruthless, psychopathic liars, cheaters, Mm -hmm. murderers. That's who rises. So what concerns me is I'm like, I embrace all those people because they make our side more effective because I mean, let's be honest, the left is just better at they have been better at um, marketing and yeah, winning the culture, winning the culture. They know mm-hmm. how they they understand the culture. They believe in culture, whereas the right is just for whatever reason, they don't get it. They don't understand culture. I think that's changing, but it's so yeah. slow. It's helped by a lot of these people from the left kind of coming over with their knowledge and skills and understanding. And they're just much better at convincing people that um, that they're much better at mocking. I mean, even just the humor on the right is so more advanced than it was just 10 years ago before this block of leftists kind of moved, shifted. So... I mean, I remember when I was first making comedy videos, there were like two other people making comedy videos. It was like Crowder and one other person. I can't even remember now. And now you have just a huge number of comedic Mm -hmm. right-leaning people and videos and things like that happening. So, but then they say stuff like that. And I think, you know, even if we win, now we're up against the same goddamn thing. Mm-hmm. So in a way we don't really have an effective we do not have an effective defense. Right. Well they're um, not gonna, like so socialism necessitates violence because whenever you intervene in a transaction you have to force one side to do something they don't want to do. That's like the essence of socialism. The people that are good at being violent win. And so and what these people with these classical liberals who kind of believe in freedom and are like aghast at like the horrors that socialism always leads to don't connect is that liberty and the freedom to think and speak is um, necessarily connected with the freedom to own property and be able to transact and trade and voluntarily cooperate with other people free of force. So you can't have one and not the other. It's like, Hey, well, we want people to think freely, but then we're going to steal your money and tell you where to work. You can deal with. Right. Like and then the second they push are- back, you're going to have to silence them uh, because you won't win that. You won't win taking people's shit from them. Um, so-, so you have to shut them up. So then yeah. like like getting involved in, in, in redistributing and nationalizing industries and the government controlling everything, you then have to suppress your opposition because you're you're violently acting. You're, you're acting violently towards them and they're going to act violently. Uh, in retaliation against you, they don't want to do it. So then you have yeah. to silence them. So then but, you need a state TV and you need to imprison dissenters. And a but there, there's always this phenomenon that they don't understand that it's not them that rise to the leadership positions. <laughs> you know, it's Stalin. It's not the well meaning, like, I just love people. I'm about peace and love. Those are not the people running the show in every single collectivist society it's yeah, always like the mafia. Who, yeah. who gets to be the godfather the guy who's the nicest guy who lets people get away with stuff <laughs> that's right, and that's right. Is- if if your political philosophy is taking from some and giving it to others which is theft you're going to end up with thieves you're going to end up with people who don't give a shit about people and can take people's stuff without any twinge of conscious conscience <laughs> So that's why Hillary Clinton and and those people are in charge and not Jimmy Dorsey people, you know, and whenever you've seen a more sort of well-meaning liberal pop up in politics, they get crushed. Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard. Um, even there have been right. others. In, remember yeah. just even this guy who I wouldn't even say qualified for that. But remember Lieberman? He had to like leave the party, yeah. become an independent. And he just became completely marginalized and sidelined. And he was Clinton's, like, he was part of the inner circle, but he just was a little more well, like a slightly more well-meaning dude. And he got crushed. 
Right. They crush those people. They're they're yeah. they and it keep they the radicals will continue to primary them uh, for more revolutionary people and more radical people. It just yeah. and the more ruthless people, the more people that are better at politics and better at lying and better at yeah. conniving and raising money and taking bribes and and rigging the elections. You know, the more that's at stake for these people to control and to profit from, um, the more ruthless and the better the people at doing corrupt things they'll get. And that's what yeah. always happens. And I don't want to make, so I was feeling a little bit down at this whole Ukraine thing, because I feel like it took two years to get everybody on board with how everyone's been lying to us about COVID. <laughs> and then this comes up and everyone just goes, <laughs> and they, and it, and they're just like, Oh no, of course the news isn't lying about Putin <laughs> invading Ukraine. And um, but, you know, trying not to make the perfect the enemy of the good, I have seen, unlike what I saw in the early pandemic days, there has been a ton more very famous, you know, the more leadership people in the on the right who are just like, um, no, I don't think so. So there's mm -hmm. there's been a huge shift in people willing to just stand against the tide. Um, I remember when the whole George Floyd thing happened, there was literally one person on the right willing to be like, this guy is not a good guy and he probably deserved what he got and he was on drugs and he's dead for a reason. In the midst of all that BLM hysteria, one person that I know of was saying that on the right and that's Candace Owens. It took a huge amount of courage for her to say that at that time. And, but now you have a situation where almost everyone I follow on Twitter, which to me is like the commentators and the journalists and stuff, almost all of those people were immediately skeptical of the Ukraine narrative. So I think that's a good thing. What concerns me is how many ordinary people I saw not be skeptical. And I'm not even saying what's right or wrong there right now. What I'm saying is in these days, in these first few days, in these moments, they were and you right away. You, you are, you, you can feel you are. It was so crystal clear that this was a narrative and we were being spoon fed a story and data and not the other data. And they're canceling Russian TV mm -hmm. and they're, you know, it's like, you're not allowed to see another perspective because that would be too hurtful. You know, we can't listen to Putin. Um, why not? Like Ameri, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Americans were like, we get all the information and we think for ourselves. And it's amazing how fast that can erode. And we get used to being denied information and then to the point of going, yeah, I guess, you know, that's right, that we shouldn't really listen to Putin. See, I, I don't agree with you there because I don't think Americans have ever been very good at avoiding, I think we've been sold narratives for, you know, for hundreds of years, but certainly post-World War II and in the rise of this era with very um, deeply corrupt uh, media institutions that, you know, work hand in glove with like I deep agree. state and these characters. And so I, you know, if you look back at like all the things that have happened in the last 30, 40, 50 years from Vietnam to Watergate to, you know, the Iran Contra stuff and the Clinton, all this stuff. Um, we were have always been spoon fed a narrative by the mainstream media. And it was only like in the nineties, I remember where talk radio and then the, the early internet where you could go and find an alternative website. And it was like, wow, someone else agrees with me or has a different spin on this. And, you know, that was the beginning of Rush Limbaugh and talk radio and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and so it's, I think, I don't know. I don't look back fondly on 20, 30 years ago thinking, oh, we really got no, it right. I, I don't, I, I know what you're I saying. I, I, I agree with you. I think that we were actually way more controlled and isolated 30 years ago in terms of what we were, what it was easy to see, but, or, you know, easy to get information, but we thought that it was part of our heritage and part of our culture and society that no, we get all the information and then we decide we thought we were getting all the information. I think, I mean, I yeah. thought that. Yeah. 
And I feel like the vibe has changed culturally in terms of people don't expect to get all the information anymore. And they're kind of like resigned to that, Mm. you know, which feels like going against America, the American values that I was raised with, even if I wasn't living it fully, I mentally thought that that's what I was living. Well, here, here's what I think I would agree with. If this is what you're saying. And I think this is true, which is, I think we considered it a value. I most like rational people would have considered it a value to hear all sides of the story. Yes. And now I think it's considered a value to suppress people who make you feel uncomfortable. Yes. So, you know, as soon as this Russia stuff happened, or, you didn't or see everyone... It's that identity thing. If you're Putin, nothing you have to say is of value. Mm -hmm. It's like, or if you're white, don't talk about race. Or if you're, you know, Mm -hmm. there's a, whether or not you have credibility and are allowed to speak is um, based on where you're coming from and who you are. And people are like, yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) You know? Yeah. What group you're uh, representing. What groups you're with. Right. If you're a Republican, you can't talk about abortion. Uh, with any credibility at all. Yeah, because you have power, you have privilege. So you have no basis because everything you do is just self-interested, you know, double speak to improve your own privilege and power. So we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to listen to the other side. Putin doesn't have any credibility. Of course, he's going to say what he, you know, whatever. And Russian TV, they're, they're led by Putin. So why would we even listen to them? It's propaganda. Meanwhile, blank out. So is the other stuff you're listening to. I mean, and I'm okay. Like, I know Russian TV is is kind of a propaganda arm of Russia, but I still want to hear what they have to say and compare their propaganda to our propaganda. I don't want to be just in a bubble of U.S. propaganda. And that's what I'm in or global propaganda, I guess. Right. And uh, it's very hard to figure out what's going on. And you actually, the interesting thing is what I have found is if you go back and start listening to people talking about this in like 2014, there were all these people warning that this was going to happen, that what the U S and NATO and and the West was doing was going to cause a war. And the whole Crimea thing being part of that, the Georgia thing being part of that. And this now is part of that. And I had no freaking idea, but if you have to go back 10 years to get, this information. Um, but it's still there. They don't let you say it now, but 10 years ago you could. And so it's still there, you know, cause the mm-hmm. internet, they haven't washed everything and scrubbed everything off the internet yet. Yeah. We've been um, on a trajectory with Putin. He aired 10 years. Don't do this. This is my red line. I'm going to start a war if you do this. And now that it happened after this arrogant, uh, Washington establishment with the West, continued to poke poke this guy yeah now we're in a, and now he's a madman and to say he's being strategic or that Listen, he has self-interest that and, you're evil if you even identify that and they've been building up this evil putin thing for years now and i mean yeah the guy has assassinated people and he arrests his political enemies and he's i'm not you know like nobody's saying he's a good guy but in this case I don't see anything wrong with what he's doing, except that war is horrible. But I actually think that he's it's our it's kind of our fault. I think those people are dying because of us. And we've to go to Ukraine into fighting. I, I don't know that they should even fight this. I, I if we're not going to defend them, they're going to lose. So we're just causing death and misery. And we're all like, oh, we support Ukraine. Go fight, go fight, go fight. Should they? I don't, I don't well, know. You, that- go, you know, you go fight then. You go fight. Meanwhile, don't tell other people to they fight. They don't have a choice. If the government says to the men, you have to fight, they don't have a choice. They have a fully conscripted army. And so all those pictures you see of the men staying to fight, it's not like the United States where these men are choosing to fight. They're, they're forced to fight. And their families are being separated from them by the government of Ukraine. So the whole way this whole thing is framed, it just anyway, my point was it couldn't have been more obvious that they were pushing this narrative on people. The propaganda was so thick and obvious. The lies, you know, the 
the constant lies about what was going on there in terms of just little things like these guys said F you and then they were all killed. And, yeah. you know, the Ukrainian soldiers but said F you Russia <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, and that was a lie. Like all of these little weird stories uh, of heroic Ukrainians are all just BS. Yeah, like the ghost and, of Kiev. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had I congressmen mean, from the United States like retweeting the ghost of Kiev stuff without even checking it, without even double checking it. Pictures of Zelensky on the front line in camo when it was like pictures from five years ago from him doing some, you know, walkabout or something. You know, <laughs> right. it's just so it was so thick and so clear, especially if you've been through COVID and you've been through that media, that media. I don't even know what to call it. it. It's the whole thing with COVID was so insane. Actually, forget it. Russiagate. It started in 2016. Mm-hmm. And that whole thing that we went through that anyone who said, I don't think there's anything here was <laughs> laughed at and called like a conspiracy theorist or something because you, you don't see any evidence. You're a conspiracy theorist. I can't. I was always this is a nothing burger. And I got so much crap for that. And at the time, I remember I wasn't even a Trump supporter. And I was saying stuff like, don't make me defend this guy. Like, this is totally nuts, th- this Russiagate thing. Yeah. Um, and three years later, it's proven, you know, that you've been lied to for three years, that all these credible sources that came out and said, oh, yes, yes, this is this is a sure thing. This is actually real. Like, there's all this evidence, but there's no evidence we still are listening to those sources and about Ukraine and, and about COVID and about COVID. And after COVID, we're still listening to the same exact freaking people about Ukraine and how many just ordinary people on the right are just like whoop, flying the Ukrainian flag. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. I just am saying did you know that it was right or wrong to do that when you did it? Or did you just do it because it seemed to make sense based on what you were seeing in the news? Because it's all a lie. Yeah, anyway. well, it's a cartoon narrative. Um, and, and this is one thing that the American media and the establishment is very good at is creating cartoon villains um, for Westerners and people that grow up on Hollywood to think that the world is composed of cowboys and Indians and, you know, bad guy, madman, and poor, poor, uh, people over here, oppressed people. And that's, you know, that's essentially the, the whole narrative of Marxism, but it's also like very built in the American psyche. And so they play on that and yeah. we constantly have a villain. We all, you know, ever since, you know, I'm comfortable with that, but the villain is the media. And these government, I mean, the, the villain is the clear villain to me. You don't listen to the villain about who the villain is. Like, why can't we keep it straight? <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we're always the good guys. I mean, the CIA is the good guy. The American military is the good guy. I the guess American that's government's it. the good guy. The media, you know, was, how can they it, be that bad? Right. It was, it was the West against the Soviets. And so you had this like good evil um, for, for some very good reason. And then. You know, when that died, we needed a new villain. And then it was the Iraq thing. And then that kind of faded. And then all of a sudden it was the Muslims and 9-11. And we had to completely lock down the country um, and, you know, start uh, fondling people in the airports, you know, to stop the terrorists. And, you know, or was the drug war and the drug cartels. And then now that's kind of all Wayne. You don't hear a lot about the Islamic terrorism. Remember that was like Every That's day incredible. Was a Every Islamic day there was an attack. ISIS. And Remember ISIS? Why hasn't there been anything? In Syria years? and the Kurds and all that stuff. All of a sudden that's gone. And, and, and now who's the enemy? Well, now it's Russia. It's got to be Russia. Yeah. It's never China, though, because the entire Washington establishment is in bed with the Chinese and they get paid by the Chinese. Right. So they're, you'll never hear that China's bad, even though what they do is orders of magnitude worse than anything Russia could do, given that Russia's economy is the size of France um, and China's economy is the size of ours, and they have a billion people and an enormous military. So, you know. And they are, they're a communist nation, and they are, we know they have concentration camps. 
And we know that they, I don't know if you watch this documentary on, um, I think it's Amazon. I, I should know the name, but I don't. I watched it about how they used to chase down pregnant women and forcibly abort yeah. their babies. The one child. Rule. The one child policy was unbelievably inhumane. And um, they actually that. had a baby kidnapping thing going on there where they would kidnap people's babies and sell them to Westerners for 25 grand a pop, the government. So uh, they're not good. You know, they're not good. I, has Putin done anything approaching any of that? I mean, I don't think so. But I'm supposed to think he's the worst guy and G is just fine. Xi gets an invitation to the World Economic Forum and, and is introduced as a great guy. So, uh, yeah, good time. I'm tired but of it. I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it. And I, I'm so tired of people not keeping it straight who the enemy is. And, but I'm heartened by at least the people now who are the ones who are the intellectual leaders of the right get it they get it lockstep i've seen everybody be like whoa 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 <laughs> wait no we're not no we're not going to war with russia over ukraine what is this, this is insanity this is nato's fault like you know all of this stuff coming out was immediate they did not fall for it for a day and so i was heartened by that because i haven't seen that before about any issue that where my gut is going, oh, you know, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Why are we just falling for all this? And my gut's usually super good about that. And I'm seeing them have the same reaction now. So did you that see that hard. UFC fighter from Arkansas? Oh, yeah, I was going to share that. I'll share that right now. That's the best thing I've seen. Yeah, I'll share that. I could talk about it for 20 minutes. And this, so, is, this is way better. If you haven't seen this, this is... Bryce Mitchell, he's a UFC fighter, and he um, just came out and gave a real well, common made... sense answer, a real American <laughs> common sense answer about the Ukraine conflict. So here he is. Well, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the whole Russia and Ukraine situation. You know, um, he here's my first thought is I'm not going nowhere to fight none of these wars for these politicians. I'm staying at home, and when the war comes to Arkansas, I will dig my boots in the ground and I will die for everything I love and I will not retreat. <laughs> if this country is invaded and everybody's saying, well, we got to we got to evacuate. We got to leave. We got I will not. I will dig my boots in the Arkansas soil and I will fight for the people that I love, for the land that I love and the way of life that I love. But I'm not going overseas to fight. I don't know what's going on, to be honest, brother. I really don't. There's he says he so eloquently, actually. Um, for the people I love, the land that I love, and the way of life that I love. I mean, could really? you be any more exact about why you would ever fight for anything? And people ridicule people like this for being anti-intellectual or whatever, you know, people that we know, you know, the, the yeah. fucking smug libertarian types and objectivist types who are like, oh, look at him with his Southern accent. Isn't he a dope? And isn't he a plebe? And he just articulated a perfect moral uh, system defense of values. Defensive individualism, yeah. It's a defensive <laughs> and individualism. The people I love, the land that I love, meaning this is mine, and the way of life, which is this cultural look. The American way of life is great. I love it, or it's, or at least it's mine. I love it. It's how I want it. And don't mess with it. It's mine. I'm going to fight for it. That's the individualist's attitude. And I don't know if you saw a poll recently that said that, I think it was Rasmussen. And I, I wish we had like a person who was looking stuff up as we talk, but there was a poll recently that said the majority of Democrats, if the US was invaded, would leave. Yeah. And the I majority of Republicans would stay and fight. <laughs> if that isn't just a perfect, a perfect demonstration of how valueless those people are and or what they value is just it's not america it's not the way of life here it's not the people they love they who do they love you know oh. well if the democrats just, are already attacking america why would they defend it they're if, they're on the offense <laughs> if they feel like they can just move to india and have this a fine life i mean that they're happy with as much as this life i don't really 
relate to that. So anyway, okay, more on more of Bryce Mitchell. So much stuff, and I don't think nobody knows what's going on fully. There's been so much political corruption in that area. You got Biden and his son making a shit ton of money off of uh, and using our tax dollars to bribe their people. That's treasonous, in my opinion. Uh, so you got Hunter Biden and his son using our tax. He's referring to when Biden said, if you don't fire this prosecutor that's looking into my son's corruption uh, or the company that is paying my son under the table or you know over the table, yeah. whatever, the kickback my son is getting, don't investigate that or I will withhold tax American taxpayer funding. A billion dollars. A billion dollars for you. And he bragged about it. And he it. bragged about it on camera. He actually did this. So we know Hunter Biden worked for Burisma, was getting paid by Burisma. And, and Joe Biden said, fire the prosecutor looking into Burisma or you don't get your U.S. money. How is that not 100 percent full on corruption? And what he says, trees, and I agree with that. Absolutely. Hey, if if Ukrainian government, if you don't do this, we're taking your tax dollars. He shouldn't be giving our tax dollars to that country anyway. We got veterans out here sleeping on the street and you're going to give our freaking tax dollars to these Ukrainians. And all the, I, brother, I don't know what's going on <laughs> over there, but I'm not going over there and fighting. And God bless anybody that's over there fighting. And I hope that this shit just gets solved. And man, I don't like war. You know what I mean? I don't want people dying and all that stuff. I don't want to be. But I don't know what's going on. There's so much stuff that I think that's corrupted that we just don't know what's truly going on over there. And I just, I pray all those people are safe. Anyway, he's so nice too. And he's like, I pray all those people are safe, but you know, I, I don't know. And I, I don't want to get involved in it, but he has feelings and sympathy for the ordinary Ukrainians. And I do too. And the ordinary Russians that are paying the price of all this discrimination. And now the, the, economic embargoes and things like that, that are just ridiculous. Somebody was saying the other day, oh, it's so moral that we are, we won't buy our gas or we won't buy our oil now from Russia, but we'll buy it. Well, so we'll have to buy more from Saudi, Venezuela, and Iran. <laughs> Thankfully, we've decided Putin is the worst person. I, I, it's so absurd. Meanwhile, we've completely cut our, our energy independence under his policies and administration. You see that the Babylon Bee said that Biden should sell Alaska back to Russia so then we could allow them to drill there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a plan. I would almost rather live under a Putin Alaska than a Biden fucking U.S. I mean, I, uh, somebody posed this question to me the other day. If Putin invaded California, what would you do? If he wasn't going to go any further than California, if it was just California, is he worse than Gavin Newsom and the crazy assholes running the state and letting all this crazy corrupt crap happen and ruining our quality of life and stuff? Is he worse? Yeah. Robbing people, banning lawnmowers, the open borders, the cutting of water and energy on purpose, like not because there's a shortage, but just because they want to save like a, a freaking shrimp that's migrating. Allowing um, massive wildfires rather than yeah, the, the fires. I was saying to somebody yesterday, I have for two years, I've been trying to take a trip into the state parks. And when every time I've planned it, there's been major forest fires and I can't go. So. And I, I, I don't, I think Russian tax rates are lower than California, too. I think, I think that's the Russian true. income Definite. tax is like thirteen percent, and we pay what forty top rate is forty federal, and then the state rate in California is over ten, right? So you're paying fifty to sixty percent taxes if you're living in California. Yes, that's and the low, corporate that's taxes than Russia. are lower in Russia than the United States. They pay a thirteen percent tax. Russians do on income up to five million dollars. 13%. Maybe we need to uh, expatriate. Maybe I'm not going to dig my feet in the soil of the California. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't dig your, don't dig your boots in the soil of California. <laughs> I would fight against it. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think my final thought here on this is 
or maybe I maybe I'll wait till after we talk about this gay thing because the, it has to do. My final thought is going to tie these things together. Um, okay, so in Florida, there was a very gay bill that uh, was apparently the left is calling it the "Don't Say Gay" bill, and I don't. I haven't read it. I'm just going to say what I've heard about it. What it is is. It applies to kindergarten through third grade. It bans discussion of sexual orientation and gender and and those types of sex topics. It bans teachers from discussing those topics with K through third graders. I don't know if you have an eight year like this. So this goes up to eight years old. I don't know if you have or interact with any other eight, you know, uh, five to eight year olds. (laughs) But I have a seven-year-old right in that sweet spot. And I can tell you, she doesn't know anything about sex. She doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand the science of sex or gender. It's it's totally inappropriate. She doesn't understand how babies are made. So she's only just realized that you can have a baby without being married. But she's not sure how that works. That's the level of mentality where she's at. Um, I've been sort of, uh, when do I tell her? When do I talk to her about this? I'm not really sure. I'm at that moment where I think, no, maybe maybe in a little bit. And she's right at the top end of this K through three. And I'm her mother. I want to have this conversation with her. I don't want some freakazoid teacher to have this conversation. So I think my point is with this, First of all, if this is something you want to do, this is grooming. This is 100% grooming for sexual deviancy or sexuality or early sexuality because um, it's literally pedophilia. And K through three, they are so young and so innocent. The only reason to talk to them about this is your own freaking perversions and your own insane cult desire to indoctrinate children into an anything goes kind of sexuality, which is not a healthy sexuality. So I don't know anybody who's in that cult and all confused about their sexuality. That's freaking happy. Like just, (laughs) I don't know a single one that doesn't look like they're ready to fucking kill themselves. I'm kind of swearing a lot today, but these people look like circus freaks ready to slit their wrists. They're all on anti-anxiety and anti-depression drugs. None of them look like they work out or or like feel good in their skin. They're pierced and dyed and tattooed and they don't like themselves. And it's not a coincidence. So I'm trying to be more like objective and Ayn Rand about it. This isn't a religious thing I'm saying here. And this isn't a prudish thing. K through three do not need to hear about your fucking sex life. Keep that to yourself. I don't need to hear about your sex life. I don't talk about my sex life. And or my orientation or my feelings of myself and my own body psychologically. That's nobody's business but mine. It's very personal. Don't make it my child's business, my innocent little child's business. It is not her business. And it is so sick yeah. to want to do this. And for them to take this bill and call it the don't say gay bill. Oh, fuck you guys. Honestly, it is sickening. And the fact that the right has no idea how to fight this. They're just letting that don't say gay thing hang out there. They have no idea how to turn the tables and call. I I see some of it on Twitter. They're getting better at saying you're a groomer. How about the don't groom our kids bill? Don't groom our kids bill, right? The anti-groomer bill. Don't sexualize our children bill. Yeah. So it's, it is sick. And then a part of me thinks, um, if you have to pass a law to stop teachers Mm -hmm. from this, from talking about this stuff with the littlest of little kids, the littlest of five-year-olds, six-year-olds. You got way bigger problems. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the whole thing needs to be burned to the ground. All of these people need to be fired. Um, yeah. We need a cultural revolution and push back now. 
I like, it, I mean, you gotta this, just stop saying now we can't, you know, I talk to parents and everyone like kowtows to these people and they're so afraid of the conflict and offending these people. Bullshit. They are sexualizing kids now. This is not. Look at these you know, people's faces with the hair and the piercings and the tattoos. Oh, they're and the, sick. The We're enabling their own mental the, illness. I'm looking at a fucking mental ward. And these are the people teaching the children about sex way before they're supposed to. And we're like, mm, that kind of makes me a little uncomfortable, but does that make me a bad person? I'm not really sure. And I really want to be a good person. And, um, and look, at the, look at these freaks and like their job is I'm going to teach other people how to live. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember thinking I, that when Miley Cyrus was on Joe Rogan and she is like talking about how shitty her, fu- I mean, she's just had this shitty life. She screwed up. She did a bunch of drugs. She lost her voice. She's wrecked herself. Why didn't anybody tell me? Nobody loved me. Blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking about writing children's books so that they know that it's okay to be, <laughs> that it's okay to be uh, sexually promiscuous and <laughs> that, you know, you can really be anything with your sexuality. And I'm like, dude, do you not see like, you don't no. know how to live life. Don't write a freaking children's book. Yeah. You sick person. You want to impose your own misery and sickness on innocent little kids. And that's what's happening. And I, yeah, this could be gone in six months. This whole thing and the Ukraine, thing, like all of this type of stuff could be crushed. It, it took them a hundred years post Frankfurt school to infiltrate like this. And have their claws and everything. It would take six months to crush these fuckers. I mean, they're just, yeah. I'm supposed to be intimidated that it took them a hundred years to destroy the best culture and the best society that's ever lived. The, the toughest, most rugged, most individualist people. It took them a hundred years to get where they are. That's, that's a positive. And some of that is still in us. And I, I, it's time, you know? It's time. Yeah, well Let's crush it. Fuck these people. They're so icky. Yeah. Get them out of polite tell society. Sh- tell them to shut up and fuck off. That's yeah. the answer to these people. I would not be passing a fucking law saying you can't do this. I'd be saying, what the hell is wrong with this whole system is going to now be smashed and audited. And the whole thing is going to be rearranged. And the only people we're hiring are people who are straight cis white male like pastors of you know not pastors because those people are sexually crazy too but you know well if you talk to a five-year-old about sex and you're not the parent i think you should be considered uh to go to a jail. groomer yeah that's i mean that's grooming. isn't that's a form of sexual abuse to, to go to an immature kid who doesn't understand what you're talking about so can't we um can't we take this idea that we needed a law to stop them from doing this as a reason to go in and smash, 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 um, you know, Florida parents. But I like the there. fact, but you know what? The funny thing is, is like Florida, every other state, I'm sure 49 states are already doing this. And this is the one state that's doing anything about it to push back. And so good for him. I'm glad at least politically and realistically like if this is happening, at least try and do something to stop it. And if that's passing a law, pass a law. We need more of it. We need more really straight, tough talk. I am so sick of the weak response that our side always has. Yeah, like get the fuck away from my kid. Like what What do you get yeah. out of here, you freak? It is not happening. You're a circus freak. You should not be telling anyone how to live, let alone a little innocent child. You're out. And if we have to tar and feather you and ride you on a rail, you're out. (laughs) I mean, I'm not advocating violence because I can't because I would get in trouble. But otherwise, (laughs) I'm not saying and we don't have to do that. I'm saying we just uh, I I mean, you have to ostracize, culturally ostracize and return values and standards to human relations. This idea that there are no standards. Anything goes, anything you want to do is okay because you're doing it. I mean, that's the essence of postmodernism yeah. is I'm going to do something because I want to do it. And who are you to tell me otherwise? And so my behavior and everything I do is okay. And I want to feel okay about all this stuff I'm doing, even if it's destructive and self-destructive. 
Um, and so in order for me to feel good about myself, I have to inculcate uh, generations of children into having no standards and no values and feel like anything goes. And then I can feel good about myself and the fact that my, de- you know, I can feel good about my own deviancy now because yeah, everyone, acno- about. everyone so... acknowledges that there are no standards. So you can't judge me now. Yeah. And I won't, yeah. I'll feel better about myself. They don't no want judge my equality. They don't want to be, they don't want to be free to have people treat them, you know, uh, politely and to not, you know, trample on their rights or whatever. They want you to approve. Yeah. And they're going after your kids. So if you don't approve, your kids are going to approve. And they love doing that. They love the feeling of power of taking your children psychologically. It is a grooming thing for sure. They want these kids to be sexually fucked up and they're winning because there's no defense. And I, I, I mean, there's starting to be more, but I guess the, the message is like, we have got to get more courageous and more like we have got to become jerks. We have to stop being nice. I think we're all really nice people and that's the problem. (laughs) You know, we need to be more, we need to be assholes. And the fact that Trump was known for being an asshole and that people really had a problem with that. It's kind of the only reason I liked him before he was elected. I liked when he said to Vicente Fox, that wall just got 10 feet taller. (laughs) Like I love that kind of stuff, but then I came to like his policies too. So I like the mean tweets. I think that we are in a time where we need more mean tweets and we need to stop being nice to these people. I, I do have compassion for people who are mentally ill, but I'm not going to let them teach my kids. And if I have to get in their face and tell them they're mentally ill and you're a freak and get away from us in order to achieve that, I will. You know, I mean, I. I don't think you can be nice and get rid of this because they are not nice. So, yeah. And they're the ones who are seeking to indoctrinate. It's not the other way around. I think we've finally reached a point where every 99% of people would say, whatever you do, if you're an adult in your personal life is your own business, go do it. And I may not like it. I may think it's bad or destructive or immoral or whatever, but I'm not going to stop you from doing it. Yeah. And so we've passed that now. Like you said, what they're going for now is not just the freedom anymore to be recognized equally under the law and all this other stuff. Um, but they want people to approve of it, to positively yeah. approve of it right. and to say, that's good. It's good. To do that. It's just as healthy to do what you're doing as someone else. There are no standards. And that's bullshit. It's not true. Right. So everybody get some courage and start just, I don't know. I, I like being nice too. I'm a, re- I'm agreeable, but I'm just, I don't know. I don't know. We got to be, we got to get fed up. And I think once you dip your toe in the cold water of not being nice (laughs) and standing up for your values and calling these people out, I think that it gets easier. I think it's that first. Well, we saw it this year, you know, with the school board in Virginia and some of the stuff where they're, the parents now are starting to get involved and that's very heartening. Um, again, I think the fall is going to be another litmus test, um, to see where the culture's at in terms of these elections, if we can get a fair election, um, just to see what the mood and the tone is, because I sense that I don't know anyone who's not absolutely fed up at the end of their rope with this stuff. So, yeah. And I think if you start speaking out, you actually will resonate with a lot of people around you. It feels like you get an avalanche of criticism, but, and that's the other thing. It does feel that way when you stand up and you say, I don't think these elections were fair. I'm not sure about Ukraine. I mean, yeah, I care about the people, but I don't know that we should be defending them and we shouldn't go to war with Russia. Whenever you take these positions that are outside the mainstream narrative, or I don't think we should wear masks or, you know, whatever it is, you do get an avalanche of criticism. They're very good at pouncing. And that goes for when I say they, I even mean the leftists that are on the right. Like these yeah, like Liz sneaky Cheney little types. fucks. They're very good at pouncing 
and making you feel like you're alone and you're weird in your opinion. But that's a lot of that is because the rest, our side often just doesn't really stand up and uh, back each other up. So that's the other thing. I mean, if you're not going to be the one in the front, back that person up, stand behind them, you know? That's yeah. Cause so a lot helpful. of people are thinking the same. I was talking to a group of doctors recently, cause I'm part of a, a doctor group and um, that's kind of fighting for freedom in medicine. And that was one of the ideas was that a lot of doctors, they'll be in a group of like 50 people and they're hearing this stuff. And if one person speaks up or two people speak up, all of a sudden, a lot of people are like, yeah, yeah, I was thinking that too. But no one wants to be the first one. Everyone's afraid of the ostr- the, the ostracism or the shaming that would come with standing against a narrative. And so it's easier to shut up and not say anything. Yeah. But as soon as one person speaks up, that makes it easier for everybody else. But it takes a lot of courage to do that. And there's a lot of people who believe what you believe, but you feel alone and they want you to feel alone. They want you to feel alone. And you're not alone. I hope this show makes you feel less alone. We're just as at the edge as you and we are ready to stand up. I don't know. I think that we've got to get some really good leaders to have to emerge here. I, and I also, on the other hand, go, no one's going to save us. Like we have to get local and push and hopefully eventually win. Things are not good. And we're about to go through a pretty bad time financially. So I don't know. The elections this year will be interesting. It will prove to me once and for all, I guess, whether or not we even have elections anymore. Um, who who gets elected and who wins. I don't understand how Lindsey Graham keeps getting elected. And, <laughs> I, you know, I, like, how are these really old establishment people who never stand up for us? How are they still in office who fought against Trump every single moment of his presidency? Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, these kinds of people. Yeah, that- those people. Why? How is this even? I know the people are with me and they must be cheating. Well, what they happens? Must be I, cheating. I think what happens is at the state level, people that are that powerful and have that much money to dole out, they can't get primaried because the Why main not? thing, because the state that they're in is going to elect a Republican. So the key is like, we want to get Mitch McConnell or Lindsey Graham not to run and get someone else to run. And the local party apparatus won't back a challenger to someone like, because they consider. Nope, Lindsey Graham will win 100%. We're not jeopardizing that. And yeah, we know he'll in. win. So why would we go another way? And Lindsey Graham, I'm sure, has lots of money coming but why in. Why isn't from there a, a populist uprising in those? Because people don't show up. Because when you go to like a Republican meeting around here, which I do, you know, or stuff like that, political meetings, very few people show up. There's, there's a handful of people that show up to the there. stuff that go that are always there. And they run everything. And it's like five people in every state, 10 people. I mean, go to any state, then you're going to find that it's a very small world of people that run these caucuses and that are delegates that want to go to this stuff and like fight for it. And, you know, go, go to, go to South Carolina and try and primary Lindsey Graham, see what happens. Go to the county parties and the county caucuses and like try and get someone else on the ballot and see what happens. There what has money to be a raise. way to get people fired up. There <laughs> has to be a way to do a populist ground up revolution of the right. Well, the left did it with AOC. They, they found very, they, they, fi- they, they targeted strategically, distri- strategically found targeted, certain districts. Yeah. Yes. And then they interviewed her and a lot of people to run for that seat. I know. You got the whole, job. It's a fascinating story. Um, it worked. It's a fascinating story. Justice Democrats is what they were called. And they were yeah. they did a nationwide search and they targeted certain districts that seemed ripe for primarying. And um, they got rid of the establishment person and they got a radical. in. Yeah. And now that radical has shaped other elections. Th- that group of radicals have changed the conversation and they've actually intimidated Nancy Pelosi to some extent. You know, I remember when (laughs) Ilhan Omar was going to get censored for like being anti-Semitic and a bunch of things she said. And Nancy Pelosi was like, well, we're not really going to do that. (laughs) She couldn't do it. She was going to do it. And then she backed off because Ilhan Omar has power. Yep. And I think AOC stood behind her and said, how dare you? And, you know, whatever. So Republicans aren't good at politics. You got to get better. 
All right. Okay. <laughs> so, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. I am taking a month off. So it's going to be four or five weeks before you get another podcast from us. Enjoy your spring. And I guess we'll see you in mid-April. Oh, and I should mention on Friday this week, I'm going to be live on the Unsafe Space podcast again, or their, um, their live podcast from 11 to 1 Pacific. And I believe that's their last ever version of that or something because the, they've uh, Carrie, who was their co-host is gone. And so they've just, they're going to cancel the show. It's the last one. And it's going to be me and Lou Perez. Do you remember him? We had him on this show. He's a comedian. So that should be super fun. Um, and then I'll be gone and then I'm going to disappear for four weeks and that's that. I'll see you on the flip side and thanks everybody. It's filled with satire and fun. It's been the demise of bad ideas And we'll know what's right when she's done So download this free podcast now And give perspectives you may lack It's concise and right and achieves world peace Guaranteed all your money back <laughs> Last time, ready?